All right, so today we're going to be finishing up chapter 22. We're going to see our first Maxwell's equation, uh, talk about conductor, and a little bit more of Gauss's law. So the first thing is our first Maxwell's equation. So as we've been studying Gauss's law, we've actually already been using one of Maxwell's equations. So I mentioned in our first lecture that all of electromagnetism can be described by Maxwell's four equations. And Gauss's law is the first of those four equations. So we saw the integral form here because we had an integral. Uh, but the more uh, conventional way to write Maxwell's equations are in their differential form. Now, since a good chunk of the class has actually taken um, vector calculus where you've seen the divergence, you can translate between these two equations using the fundamental theorem for divergences. So that just states that the uh, integral over a surface, a closed surface of some vector field is equal to the divergence of that vector field over some volume. So this is the fundamental theorem for divergences and this is how we translate uh, or how we get from the integral form to the differential form. Now I just want to spend a minute or two um, talking about what these equations conceptually mean. Now I said before, so the differential form, if you've taken a vector calculus, is much more intuitive and easy to sort of just eyeball what this equation is telling you compared to this, um, you know, understanding sort of like what a surface integral uh, like physically means is a little bit more challenging uh, than looking at it in the differential form. So uh, you don't have to, I'm not going to test you on the divergence here, but it's good to conceptually understand uh, physically what these equations are telling you. So just a little recap, uh, if you have seen the divergence um, and this operator before, this little upside down triangle is just a vector where each component is the derivative with respect to the x component, the y component, or the z component. So that this is the x component here, derivative with respect to x, y component, derivative with respect to y, z component, derivative with respect to x. So since this is a vector, you can dot it into a function and take the derivative of each component. So if you dot this uh, operator into a, some random function, you'll have the derivative of the x component of that function with respect to x, the derivative of the y component of that function with respect to y, and the uh, derivative with respect to z of the z component. So what this uh, physically uh, tells us, if you're, and this is called uh, the divergence, and we'll see why it's called that in a second, it's very uh, self-explanatory. If you have a function with a positive divergence, that means that your function sort of uh, diverges away from somewhere. It diverges away from like a point, let's say. So this would be a case of positive divergence. You can think of it uh, like a fluid where a source of your fluid, like a faucet, is a positive divergence. It's introducing uh, fluid flow into your system. A negative divergence would be like a sink. So fluid is sinking and uh, you're losing fluid flow into your sink. So that would be like a, a vector field that looks like this has a negative divergence. And you can think of like a little sink here where your fluid is going into this uh, sink. And then uh, a field with no divergence would just look like this, maybe just a constant field uh, in one direction would look like a zero divergence field because none of these vectors are diverging away from anything. It's just constant. There's no source. There's no sink within your field. So now you might notice that these look a little bit like something uh, we've seen already, and they do. So what uh, the first Maxwell's equation, Gauss's law, tells us physically... Oops, let me write that as Q. So what this equation is telling us physically is that for the electric field, charges act as sources or sinks of the electric field. If you want to think of the electric field as like a fluid, uh, you can think of it that way too. So we already saw that this is the electric field for a positive point charge. We know the electric field of a negative point charge.
So all this tells us is that the electric field diverges away from positive charges. It's a source. Positive charges are a source of electric field. And negative charges are a sink of electric field. The, the fluid flow, the electric field lines sink into a positive charge. And the analogy between a fluid and the electric field here is actually a very appropriate analogy. So if any of you have heard of three blue, one brown, um, he has a really good video about uh, this for the electric and magnetic fields um, and Maxwell's equations. So I linked it here. So I highly recommend this video. Um, it's very illuminating, uh, a good way to, to visualize uh, Maxwell's equations and the electric and magnetic field. All right, so that's our first of four Maxwell's equations. So now let's get into uh, conductors. So first, just some definitions. A conductor is uh, a material which is usually a metal where the charges are free to move. And then an insulator just means the charges are not free to move around. So yesterday when we did our uniformly charged uh, sphere, right, we had a sphere where there was charge distributed uniformly throughout. That would be an example of an insulator because our charges were fixed inside the sphere and they weren't free to move. So that's an insulator. Um, anytime you see a problem that references something made out of metal, uh, so if it says, oh, you have a metal sphere, you can automatically assume that that's a conductor uh, because essentially every metal is a conductor. Uh, the electrons in a metal are free to move around. So uh, that's why metal is, is a very good uh, conductor of electricity because those electrons are free to move. So there are three important properties of conductors that you should uh, memorize. So the three important properties are that uh, the charges in a conductor are free to move around, as I mentioned. The second is that the electric field inside a conductor is always zero in electrostatics. Now, when we do electrodynamics, um, that won't always be true, but for electrostatics, your electric field inside a conductor is always zero. And then third, the uh, charges inside a conductor rest on the surface of the conductor. So let's talk about why this is the case. So why is the electric field zero? Um, inside a conductor when we're talking about electrostatic fields. So let's think back to yesterday, our uh, uniformly charged sphere. And let's say we had a bunch of uh, positive charges distributed uniformly throughout that sphere. So we've got a bunch of positive charges distributed. And now let's assume that this sphere is a conductor. So let's assume that the uh, charges in this sphere are free to move around now. So we used Gauss's law yesterday and we found the electric field of this scenario, right? We said that the electric field inside the sphere, when we have a uniform charge distribution, was three times rho, whatever that charge density was, uh, sorry, rho times r, over three epsilon naught, in the r hat direction. So that means that inside this sphere, we had an electric field that was pointing in the r hat direction, everywhere inside the sphere. So that means that inside the sphere, there's an electric field pointing outward. Now, if we say that these charges in here are actually free to move around, that means they're gonna feel a force from the electric field, and they're gonna feel a force pushing them outward. And since they're free to move around, they're gonna move outward. So all of these charges will actually move to the surface of our sphere if they're free to move around. So they'll all move now to the surface. And this is actually the only uh, stable configuration. It might seem a little counterintuitive that all of your charges for a conductor will rest on the surface but that's actually the only stable configuration in electrostatics is to have all of your charges on the surface. And that's because when they're on the surface, there won't be any electric field inside anymore. So now we have no enclosed charge. Oops, we've got no enclosed charge inside this sphere. So now the electric field inside our conductor goes to zero, which means there's no force inside uh, the sphere pushing the charges around. So this is actually the only stable way that these charges can uh, distribute themselves. And now another thing to uh, keep in mind about conductors is that the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface of a conductor. 
So when we have any conducting surface, so let's just say we have some uh, conductor here, our electric field at the surface will always be perpendicular to it. Uh, if we have a sphere, so let's say we have a conducting sphere, our electric field will be perpendicular to it, which means at the surface it will be in the r hat direction. And we'll never have a scenario, uh, let's say, where the electric field is at an angle to our conductor surface. So or let me draw that a little bit. So we'll never have a scenario like this where our electric field is at an angle there. The electric field will always be perpendicular at the surface of a conductor. And you can actually derive this um, if you take like graduate um, or maybe even in uh, 112A. If you take 112A, you can derive the boundary conditions for the electric field at a conductor and you'll find that they have to be perpendicular. So this is all derivable from Maxwell's four equations. Okay, and now let's figure out what is the electric field here? So what's the magnitude of the electric field just outside a conductor? So let's say we have a conductor, a big conducting slab. So we've got some big conductor here where let's say it's situated um, you know, on the x-axis, everything below the x-axis is the conductor, everything above the x-axis is just like vacuum. So what is the electric field there if our conductor has a positive surface charge? So just the top layer of our conductor has a surface charge and then everything, uh, don't forget, everything uh, below the surface inside the conductor will have that zero electric field. So what is the electric field just above the surface of the conductor? Well, we can use Gauss's law. So what we're going to want to do is draw a little cylinder. Let's draw a little Gaussian surface right here that sort of straddles the surface of the conductor. So half of it is above the conductor, half of it is below inside the conductor. Now, we know that the electric field is going to be upward. This looks sort of like our infinite uh, charged sheet, our infinite sheet of charge. So our electric field is going to be in this direction because our uh, conductor here is symmetric. So let's use Gauss's law to figure out what the electric field is above the conductor. So our Q enclosed is going to be however much charge is enclosed right here. So if I say that uh, this surface of my cylinder has surface area A, that means that this is enclosing sigma times A charge. So the Q enclosed is going to be sigma A over epsilon naught. And then my electric field is constant over that surface. And my area is just A. So now I can just solve for the electric field. I see that my areas cancel. And I'm left with just the electric field is sigma over epsilon naught. So this is the electric field just outside the surface of any conductor. Any conductor we see the electric field just outside of it will be equal to the surface charge on that conductor divided by epsilon naught, and the electric field will be perpendicular to that uh, surface. And this is true whether we have a flat plane or a uh, sphere, this will always be true. This magnitude of electric field in whatever direction is perpendicular to your surface. All right, now let's talk about induced charges. So. When we have a conductor where charges are free to move around, uh, we can induce a charge on things. So let's say this is a conducting sphere. Um, it's a solid metal sphere, and it has zero total charge. So Q total is zero here. But I'm going to bring in now a positive uh, point charge. So I bring in a positive point charge and hold it near this uncharged conductor. What will happen? Well, since my charges in a conductor are free to move around, and you know, in this case our conductor is metal, all of the electrons that are free to move around in our conductor are going to be pulled towards the positive charge over here. So all of our negative charges, all of our electrons, are going to want to sit on this side of the conductor. 
which will leave this side of the conductor positively charged because all of the electrons went over here and all of the positive charges then went over here but our total charge on this sphere is still zero. The total net charge is still zero, even though the two sides, one has a negative, one has a positive charge. And then if this happened to be a negative charge, you would induce a positive charge on the side closest to it and a negative charge on the side furthest from it. Now we can also have what are called grounded conductors. So a grounded conductor, you'll see it drawn like this. Let's say we have some... Uh, conducting sphere there, you'll see a ground <clears throat> uh, depicted like this. It's sort of just a little thing going into the ground and then like three lines here. So that means that uh, whatever this conductor is, is grounded. And that just means that the conductor is free to share electrons with the ground. Since the earth is so huge and has so many um, like atoms in it, a grounded conductor can share electrons with the ground. Uh, so if we brought in a positive charge here, and let's say that this little conductor we have here is neutral, if we brought in a positive charge close to this conductor, it would pull electrons out of the ground and they would be attracted to this side over here and they would uh, want to be close to this positive charge. So it will pull electrons out of the ground and then if you disconnected this wire that connected the conductor to the ground, your sphere would now be negatively charged because it pulled an excess of negative charge from the ground into the sphere. So that's one way that you can charge things um, is by grounding them, holding something near it, and then disconnecting that ground. Grounding is also the way um, uh, buildings protect themselves against uh, lightning strikes. So every house pretty much has a grounding rod where if the house is hit by lightning, it redirects that into the ground and disperses the excess electrons from the lightning uh, bolt into the ground. And since, like I said, the earth is so big, it can just absorb that without any damage. So this here is a picture that my husband took from our apartment of lightning striking the Freedom Tower in New York. Um, so this tower has a huge rod that goes all the way from the tip here, uh, usually they're copper because copper is very conductive, uh, all the way down into the ground and it will disperse this entire bolt of electricity from damaging the building. So it has a rod that goes up all like 100 stories uh, from the top all the way into the ground and every single skyscraper is going to have one of these. Otherwise uh, the building would absorb all of that electricity and that would cause a lot of damage. All right, so that's what's meant by a grounded conductor and a little bit of how they're used. So now let's talk about cavities inside a conductor. So if I have a neutral conductor, so let's say I just have a conducting shell, it uh, is neutral, it has no charge on it, and I put a positive charge in the center like this. So this is a positive point charge, uh, we'll call it Q. What will happen? So when I say that the charges in here or in any conductor are free to move around, um, if it's neutral, that just means that it has equal amounts of positive and negative charge, uh, not that it necessarily has no charges in it. Um, a conductor is assumed to just have an equal amount of positive and negative charges since it is made up of a metal. So the electrons in this metal, the negative charges, are going to be attracted towards the positive charge in the center, right? So the negative charges are going to want to orient themselves as close as possible to this positive charge here. So you're going to get a surface charge of negative charge on this inner uh, surface, on the inner cavity wall. Meanwhile, the positive charges in the conductor are going to want to get away from this positive center charge, and they're going to try to get pushed out as far away as they can. So they're going to orient themselves on the outer surface of the conductor because they're repelled by that inner positive charge. So now let's figure out what the surface charge density of the inner and outer uh, surface here is. So this inner surface, we'll call this uh, radius A and radius B. The surface charge density on the inner surface is going to be negative Q divided by the surface area of that inner surface. 
Now this negative Q here is because whatever charge you put at the center here, an equal and opposite amount will be attracted uh, towards it from the conductor. So this will induce a charge of negative Q spread throughout this inner surface. So this inner surface here has a total charge of negative Q, and then I just divide by the surface area of this inner sphere, which is 4 pi A squared, uh, and that's the surface charge density that's now induced on this inner surface. Now on the outer surface, we're going to have positive Q induced out here. So we're going to have positive Q, 4 pi B squared, so the total induced charge on the outer surface divided by the surface area of the outer surface, which is just 4 pi b squared. And now you can see that the uh, total charge of my sphere is still zero, right? Because I induced a negative Q on the inner surface and a positive Q on the outer surface. So my shell overall is still neutral, even though it has these induced uh, surface charges on the inner and outer. Overall, the total charge is still zero. Now, what if my cavity was off-center a little bit? So let's say I have another neutral conductor. So this entire conductor is still neutral, has no total charge on it. And I put a point charge in a cavity that's a little bit off-center. Well, the same thing is going to happen where it's going to induce an equal and opposite charge uh, in the shell surrounding it. So if this is uh, Q, we're going to get negative Q induced on this inner uh, cavity wall. But the induced charge on the outside is still going to be uniform. It's going to be uniformly distributed along the outside, and it's going to have a total charge on the outside of plus Q. And the reason that is, is that even though you might think that, well, since this charge here, this positive charge, is closer to the surface, there should be like something different around here. There should be more charge on the surface over here or less charge. Um, you'd expect it sort of not to be completely uniform on the outside. Now the reason that that is, is because remember we said that the electric field inside a conductor is zero. So the electric field all inside here is zero. So that means that the outer surface of the conductor has no idea where this positive charge is located. All it knows is that there's a positive charge inside it. But since the electric field is zero, there's no way basically for that information to reach the surface. So the conductor uh, on the outer surface doesn't know where this cavity is. And this is true also even if we have uh, an oddly shaped cavity, so it doesn't have to be a circle. If we introduced uh, some kind of weird shaped cavity, you would still get negative charge with equal and opposite magnitude uh, compared to the point charge in the center. But again, on the outside, it would still appear as a uniform surface charge. So no matter where the cavity is or what shape it is, the outer surface of the conductor will simply show how much charge is inside. It won't tell you where inside it is um, or how it's arranged. It's just going to show you that there's a total charge of positive Q somewhere inside this conductor, and that's it. So conductors hide the location and shape of the cavity from the outside world. And this is true uh, even for multiple cavities. And you can use Gauss's law um, to sort of uh, convince yourself of this. So in this case, let's say I have a charge of 2Q inside here. So I know that I'm going to have an induced charge uniformly on the outside here of positive 2Q. And an induced charge of negative 2Q on this inner surface here. So outside this conductor, it's going to look like the electric field of just a point charge of charge 2q. And the same goes for this case where I have two separate cavities. Still, I'm going to get a uniform surface charge on the surface of this conductor of total charge 
positive 2q, and my electric field outside the conductor will once again look like that of a point charge of magnitude 2q. So even though in one of these conductors I have a single point charge of 2q, and it's kind of off-center, and then in this one I have two separate uh, charges of 1q each, the electric field outside the conductor looks the same. And that's because the conductor is shielding the information about how this charge is distributed from the outside world. So now let's check what we know uh, about Gauss's law and see if that's consistent with what we know about conductors. So let's say I have a neutral conducting shell, so it has inner radius A, outer radius B. Um, and then I put a point charge of uh, charge Q, a positive point charge at the center. And I want to use Gauss's law to find the electric field everywhere. So let's start with Gauss's law. So we'll have E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So let's look inside here first. So let's look at where R is less than the inner radius A. So what is the electric field in there? Well, my Q enclosed here is just this plus Q, right? So I have E dot dA is just positive Q over epsilon naught. And my uh, Gaussian surface is just a sphere of radius uh, R. So I just have E 4 pi R squared is equal to Q over epsilon naught. Solve for E and I get Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. And since it's symmetric, this is in the R hat direction. So I just get the electric field of a point charge. So inside this sphere, this point charge is just creating the electric field of a point charge, and that's it. Uh, now, if I go to the area in between these two um, surfaces, so inside the conductor between A and B, so if I go between A and B, now my Gaussian surface is no longer here. So let's draw our Gaussian surface between A and B. So our Gaussian surface will be somewhere in there. And now I also know that this positive charge, since this whole thing is a conductor, is going to induce a charge of negative Q on this inner surface. So I'm going to get an induced charge here of negative Q. So I have negative Q induced around this whole surface. So when I do E dot, e dot dA, what is my Q enclosed now? Well, my total enclosed charge now is positive Q and the induced charge of negative Q. So my induced charge is Q minus Q, which is just zero. So my enclosed charge here is just zero, which means my electric field is zero. So my electric field inside the conductor is just zero, which is what we expected. So now let's do outside the conductor. So now we're at a Gaussian surface somewhere out here. So when R is greater than the radius B, what is my Q enclosed? Well, I have positive Q. I have an induced charge of negative Q. But on the outside of the sphere, or this uh, shell, I also have now an induced charge of positive Q on the outside of this shell. So then I have another positive Q. So that means that my total enclosed charge is just Q, which means that my electric field, when I do the integral, I'll end up with this, because I've just got the surface area of my Gaussian surface, which is a sphere. 
So I have E 4 pi r squared is equal to Q, total enclosed charge is just Q divided by epsilon naught, and I'm back with just the electric field of a point charge again. So when we're doing Gauss's law for conductors, you always want to include your induced charge in the total enclosed charge. So outside this shell, all we see is that we just have the electric field of a point charge, and these induced charges basically cancel out. Now it's very important when you're doing Gauss's law, you have to include your induced charges in the total enclosed charge. So if you have an induced charge within your Gaussian surface, you have to include that when you're doing Gauss's law. Otherwise, if we didn't include the uh, induced charge, we wouldn't have gotten E is equal to zero inside the conductor like we expected. So you have to include your induced charges uh, when doing Gauss's law in a conductor. All right, now let's see a cylindrical example. So let's say we have an infinite conducting cylinder of radius A with charge per unit length lambda. So each like uh, little slice of this cylinder, each cross-sectional slice, has a charge lambda. And let's pretend this is uh, infinite, goes uh, off infinitely far in either direction. So we want to find the electric field everywhere. So the first place we want to look is inside the conductor. So inside our cylinder, where R is less than A, we're going to have E dot dA, Q enclosed, epsilon naught. Now you might think your Q enclosed here has something to do with lambda, but since we said it's a conducting cylinder, we know that all of the charge is situated on the outside of the conductor. So while we're inside the conducting cylinder here, there's no charge. It's all outside uh, on the surface here. So our Q enclosed when we're inside the cylinder is just zero. So that means that our electric field inside is zero, as we expect inside a conductor. Now let's do outside the conductor. So outside the surface of this cylinder, where R is greater than A, now our Gaussian surface is out here. And we can think of our Gaussian surface sort of as a little cylinder that's enclosing our uh, conducting cylinder. So let's say our Gaussian surface uh, is a little cylinder here of length L and some radius R. So what is going to be our enclosed charge? Well, now we have a cylinder of length L that's enclosing a charge per unit length of lambda. So our enclosed charge is just going to be lambda times L, and then we divide that by epsilon naught. Now our electric field is going to be constant over our Gaussian surface. And then what is dA? Well, dA is just the outside uh, shell of our Gaussian cylinder here, and the surface area of the uh, uh, round part of a cylinder is just 2 pi r l. It's just the circumference of your cylinder times the length. So our area element is just 2 pi r l. And now we can see our l's cancel, and we will get that the electric field outside the cylinder is simply lambda over 2 pi epsilon r, which looks just like the electric field that we found for an infinite line charge. Um, so a conducting cylinder with a charge per unit length of lambda will look just like that of an infinite line charge uh, once you're outside the conductor. And this will be in the r hat direction as well. Okay, now let's do one more example with two conducting cylinders. So if we have an infinite cylinder like we just had, and then we place over it another conducting cylinder. You'll see this called sometimes uh, concentric conducting cylinders. So concentric just means that they share the same axis. So we have here a uh, thick uh, conducting cylinder. Then we have empty space in here, so it's just vacuum in here. And then we have an infinitely thin conducting cylindrical shell over it. The inner conductor 
has a charge per unit length of positive lambda. The outer one has a charge per unit length of negative lambda. And the inner one has radius A, outer one has radius B, and we want to find the electric field everywhere. Well, inside, we know that inside our first conductor, where R is less than A, we know that the electric field is going to be exactly like what we just found in the previous problem because it, it has no uh, enclosed charge in here. All of the charge is still situated on the outside of this conductor. So in here, we have total enclosed charge zero, and our electric field is zero. So we've got zero electric field. Now, inside here, in between our two cylinders, so in here, what is our electric field? This is going to be between A and B. Well, now our total enclosed charge still looks exactly like our previous problem, right? Because our enclosed charge is just that of this infinite cylinder. And the charge outside here of the uh, second cylinder doesn't contribute yet. So our electric field in between the cylinders is just that of the single infinite cylinder that we just found. So we just have this from our last problem. And now what about outside? So outside where R is greater than B, we'd have a Gaussian surface out here. Well, now what is our total enclosed charge? Well, for each, no matter how uh, long we make our Gaussian cylinder, so if you make a little Gaussian surface cylinder around these two concentric cylinders, no matter how long you make your cylinder, the total enclosed charge is always going to be plus lambda times L minus lambda times L, right? So we're going to have plus lambda L minus lambda L. So the length of the cylinder uh, the length of our Gaussian cylinder won't matter. The point is that we have equal and opposite charges, so we're going to have plus lambda minus lambda, and our total enclosed charge will always be zero. So our total enclosed charge will always be zero, which means our electric field outside the two conductors is zero. So the only place we have an electric field here is just in between these two charges. Everywhere else it's zero. All right, so that's all the information that we're going to cover um, today for chapter 22. So this is sort of just like a conceptual problem. Uh, so a certain region of space is bounded by an imaginary closed surface that contains no charge. Is the electric field always zero everywhere on the surface? If not, under what circumstances is it zero? So if we have some random surface here, and we say that uh, it has no enclosed charge, so Q enclosed is zero. Is the electric field necessarily zero over this surface? No, it's not, because all we know is that the flux through this surface is zero. So Gauss's law only tells us that E dot dA is equal to the Q enclosed over zero, and in this case, if Q enclosed is zero, all this tells us is that the flux is zero, not necessarily that E uh, itself is zero, because we could have a scenario where E dot dA, if this dot product has a cosine of 90 degrees, where they're perpendicular, that dot product will be zero, but E itself is not necessarily zero, right? You can have a dot product of two vectors where the dot product comes out to zero, but neither of the two vectors are themselves zero. They're just perpendicular. And another way to think of this is that uh, whatever electric field you have in this region, every electric field line just comes into the surface and then back out of it. So maybe you have a charge over here where every field line emanating from that charge simply goes through the surface and then back out. So the net flux going through that surface is zero, but the electric field around here is not necessarily zero, right? There is an electric field um, from this point charge out here. Now, in what cases uh, is the electric field zero? Well, if it was uh, inside a conductor, so if we had 
a conductor here and we chose some Gaussian surface inside our conductor, we know the electric field is always zero inside a conductor. So in that case, our electric field would be zero everywhere along the surface of our Gaussian surface if we're inside a conductor um, and we're in electrostatics. And then another scenario where we could have a, a zero electric field on the surface of our Gaussian surface is in those very, very highly symmetric um, problems that we covered earlier and yesterday. So if you have, let's say, a charged sphere with positive Q, and then you have surrounding it a, a, a negatively charged sphere of negative Q, and you draw your Gaussian sphere perfectly symmetrically around those two spheres, so your electric field will be zero um, along uh, around this surface or any surface you draw out here because of the high degree of symmetry uh, where these two charges cancel out and you're left with zero uh, total charge inside your Gaussian surface. Uh, now I should point out, uh, I should really change the wording of this problem to say no net charge. So when I post the problem, I'll change that to, uh, to no net charge. Okay, so let's go on to number two. So this one's a slightly more complicated um, Gauss's law problem. All right, so for this one, we have a small conducting spherical shell with inner radius A. So both of these uh, shells here are conducting and they have like a thickness to them. So before we were looking at infinitely thin shells, now here they both have uh, an inner radius and an outer radius, so they have some thickness. So the inner radius is A, uh, the outer radius of B is our first shell. Then we have a larger conducting spherical shell with inner radius C and outer radius D. Uh, the inner shell has a total charge of positive 2Q and the outer shell has a charge on it of positive 4Q. So we want to find uh, the electric field everywhere. So let's start inside our two shells. So let's uh, do when R is less than A. So we're gonna draw a Gaussian sphere in here. So we can kind of see right away that our electric field inside there is gonna be zero, right? So we have E dot DA, Q enclosed. Actually, let me write this up here for every part we're gonna be using Gauss's law. So we can see right away that the Q enclosed is zero inside our uh, two shells when we're in that center portion there. So since this is very symmetric, we can just say, well, the electric field is zero if there's no enclosed charge. So we can say right away that E dot DA is zero, therefore the electric field is zero. Now, what about in between the two shells? So in between A and B, what is going to be our total enclosed charge? So, oops. so now our Gaussian surface is in here. And there's two ways we could go about this. We could say, well, I know that we're inside a conductor, so I know right away that my electric field is zero and I don't even have to do Gauss's law. So you could just jump right to E is zero because we're in a conductor. Or you can say, all right, well, I want to just check with Gauss's law that my electric field really is zero in there. So since this uh, inner shell here, we were told has a, a total charge of positive 2Q, and we know that for conductors, all of the charge rests on the surface. And that's going to be the outer surface. So even if your conductor has a, a cavity in it and it has a total charge distributed on that conductor, it will still all go to the outside of the conductor and there'll be no charge on the inner surface. So all of our uh, positive 2Q is actually going to rest on that outer surface. So there's no charge in here, it's just zero. So we still, in our Gaussian surface inside the um, shell here, we still have enclosed no net charge, so our electric field is still zero, which is what we expect. So we have Q enclosed, 
is also zero. So we are very confident that our electric field is zero in there. Now, uh, let's look at the region in between uh, B and C. So now we're moving outward a little bit. So now we're looking at the region, our Gaussian uh, surface is no longer in there. We're looking at the region here now. So we're going to draw a Gaussian surface in between our two shells. And now what is the uh, total enclosed charge in this Gaussian shell? Well, it's positive 2q because it's only enclosing the inner shell, which has a charge of positive 2q. So now our E dot dA is equal to uh, positive 2q over epsilon naught. Uh, our surface area of our Gaussian surface is just a sphere, so it's the electric field times 4 pi r squared, 2q epsilon naught. Solve for E, we get 2q over 4 pi epsilon r squared. And since this is uh, uh, in the r hat direction, we'll put a little r hat, and that is our electric field in between these two shells. And this makes sense because only the charge inside our Gaussian sphere contributes, and it's acting as if it's just a point charge in the center, since this is a sphere. So we just uh, have the electric field that looks like that of a point charge located at the center in between these two shells. All right, so now we can go on to the region inside the outer shell. So now we want to put our Gaussian surface inside here. So this is in between uh, C and D. So again, we can just say right away, well, I was told that this shell is a conductor, so I know my electric field is zero, end of story. But let's double check with Gauss's law. So what is the Q enclosed uh, in between uh, the inner and outer surface of this larger shell. So what is the total enclosed charge? Well, I know that I have positive 2q on the inner shell here. Now this positive 2q here is going to induce a charge on the inner surface of the outer shell. So we're actually going to induce, let me, we have positive 2q on this shell, on the outer surface of that shell. And then it's going to induce a negative 2q on the inner surface of this shell. So we have negative 2q on this surface and positive 2q on this surface. So now my total enclosed charge is still 0, right? Which is what I expected. So my total enclosed charge is plus 2q minus 2q, which is 0. So I am back with E dot dA is equal to 0. So my electric field is equal to 0, which is what I want inside a conductor. OK, now let's look at the final uh, region, which is when we're outside both of these shells. So when r is uh, greater than the outer, uh, radius of the outer shell, which is D. So now we're going to draw our Gaussian surface out here. So somewhere out there is our Gaussian surface. All right, so the first thing we want to do is let's think conceptually about what we expect our electric field to look like. So we're told that the inner shell has a total charge of plus 2q, and the outer shell has a total charge of plus 4q. So what we would expect is that outside both of these shells, the electric field should look like the point charge of plus 2q plus 4q. So we would expect the electric field of a point charge with plus 6q. Now let's prove that with Gauss's law. So what is our... Uh, Q enclosed. So we said we know it's going to end up being plus 6Q, but let's 
double check that this works out. So we have plus 2q here. And then we know that this outer shell has a total charge of plus 4q. So if we didn't have this plus uh, 2q on the inner shell, let's just say we just had one large outer shell with plus 4q, we would expect all of the charge to be situated on the outer surface. So we would expect all of the charge to just be on the outer surface. But we do have a charge in here, right? And it induced a charge of negative 2q. So now pretend we don't have this 4q here, all right? So just pretend this is neutral. If we induced a negative 2q on this inner shell, we would induce a positive 2q out here, right? So now we can look at all of the induced and all of the free charges that we put on the um, shells. So now on the outer surface of the shell, we have an induced charge of plus 2q and a free charge of plus 4q. And free charge just means um, charge that is not induced, it's charge that like someone put there, right? So we put 4q on the sphere somehow. So now we can see that when we take into account both of those things, we actually get a total charge of plus 6q on the outer surface of this shell. So now we see that our total enclosed charge, because remember for Gauss's law, we have to include all of the induced charges when we're calculating our net charge. We have plus 2q from the inner ring or the inner shell, minus 2q from the induced charge here. Then we have plus 2q from the induced charge here. And then we have plus 4q uh, that we put on the outer shell here. So we see that all of this uh, simplifies to 6q. So then we just have e dot dA of 6q epsilon naught. We have a sphere. And we end up with the electric field of a 6q point charge outside our two shells. So uh, this is very important because remember, when we were talking about cavities, we said that the uh, conductor will shield from the outside world the information about what kind of cavities it has inside and how the charges are distributed. So the only thing that's reflected on the outer surface of our conductor is the fact that there's a total charge of 6q inside. So uh, make sure you understand how I calculated all the um, induced charges and everything. This is a really um, good type of problem to, to be comfortable with. Okay, so now let's go on to just our third problem. So this one is a little bit uh, of a challenge with the integral, but there's no use substitution. Um, so we have an electric, uh, so we have a, a charged sphere with a charge density given by rho naught times r. So we have a charged sphere and it has a charge density of rho naught r. So rho naught is just some constant, it could be like five, and r is the uh, distance from the center of this, the sphere. So that means that as we get further and further out in the sphere, our charge gets more and more dense. So at the very center of the sphere, there's no charge because r is zero. And at the very outside of the sphere, that's where our charge is the densest. So let's say, uh, I forgot to write the radius. So let's just say this has radius capital R. We wanna know um, what is the electric field everywhere? So the electric field inside and outside the sphere. So let's first look inside our sphere. So when R is less than capital R, we're gonna have obviously Gauss's law. So the first thing is let's just draw some Gaussian surface wherever inside our sphere here. Okay, so that's our Gaussian surface. So I'm going to first just write E times the surface of my Gaussian surface. And then let's think about the enclosed charge. So how much enclosed charge is inside this Gaussian sphere, inside my, my um, charge sphere? Now you might just say, well, I can do exactly what we did when we did a uniformly charged sphere. 
where I just did my Q enclosed was the uh, charge density times the volume of my Gaussian sphere. And if the sphere is uniformly charged, you can do that, that's fine. But this sphere is not uniformly charged because as you move out through the sphere, this row is changing. So you can't just multiply because you won't get the right answer. What, what, which row would you multiply by? Um, the, the row is changing throughout the volume. So you have to integrate. So you have to integrate the charge density. So to find Q enclosed in our Gaussian sphere here, you're going to have to integrate the charge density. So what we're going to do is we're going to think of, now you can do this in spherical coordinates. If you've seen spherical coordinates, you'll get the same answer. But if you haven't, what we're going to do is we're going to think about um, just like we did with the charged disk, where we thought about concentric rings and then integrated over those rings, we're going to think of this in terms of shells. So we're going to think of concentric shells uh, moving out as we integrate. So each shell is going to have a charge of rho naught times r times the surface area of that shell, which will be 4 pi r squared and then that will be uh, with respect to dr. So if we integrate this, we'll have the total enclosed charge in some uh, Gaussian uh, sphere of radius r. So now this is where uh, we have to also be careful with our r's because my r here and my r here, even though they're both small r's, are different. One's a variable of integration and one is a uh, radius of my Gaussian sphere. So if my Gaussian sphere is, let's say, fixed at radius small r, when I integrate, I need a different variable of integration because I'm integrating from 0 to r, which is the radius of my Gaussian surface in there. So I'm going to put a prime on these r's again just to show that they're different r's. It's my variable of integration, not the radius of my Gaussian surface. And again, you could call this anything you want. If you want to call it S, if you want to call it P, if you want to call it X, whatever you want, um, just to differentiate those two R's. So let's integrate this. We'll pull out our constants. We've got rho naught, 4 pi, and we're integrating R cubed dr. So the integral of uh, R prime cubed will just be 1 over 4 r to the 4, and then evaluated from 0 to r will just give us 1 over 4 r to the 4. Okay, so this is our total enclosed charge in some uh, Gaussian surface here. So our 4s cancel, so let's see, we get uh, rho naught pi r to the 4. So let's put that in our Q enclosed. So we have rho naught pi r to the 4 over epsilon naught. And now we can just uh, solve for E here. So we get the electric field is rho naught. Our pi's will cancel. Our r squared will cancel with the r to the 4 to leave r squared, and then we get uh, 4 epsilon naught, and this is going to be in the r hat direction. So now let's do outside the sphere. So this is inside, so I'll do e in. So now outside the sphere, when r is uh, greater than capital R, we're going to have Gauss's law, E dot dA. So now, what is our Q enclosed? Well, now we're going to have a Gaussian surface that's over this whole uh, sphere here. So we're enclosing the entire sphere. So we still have to integrate to find our total enclosed charge, but we're going to be integrating to capital R, right? Because we're integrating over the whole sphere, so we can integrate so let me make this a little bit smaller. 
So we can integrate now to capital R. So when we do Q enclosed for the entire sphere, we're going to be doing the same thing where you think of it in terms of um, like concentric shells and integrate over the radius of those shells. Um, but we're integrating, our limits of integration are zero to capital R. So, oops, we're going to have the exact same integral. So you can see the integral will uh, basically come out exactly the same, except here we're going to have uh, zero to capital R. which will give us one over four capital R to the four. So our total enclosed charge for the entire sphere is that. So now we can just take this, plug this in our enclosed charge here. So we've got E, uh, the surface area of our Gaussian surface is four pi R squared. The total enclosed charge is rho naught pi capital R to the four divided by epsilon naught. And now we can just uh, solve for our electric field, so our pi's cancel, uh, and that's it. So now we have the electric field is equal to rho naught r to the four over four epsilon r squared, and this is in the r hat direction. Okay. So there's a couple things um, I want to point out here. Well, really just one main thing. So this electric field outside the sphere, uh, one like good sanity check when you're doing problems like this, one thing to check is that your answer makes physical sense, obviously. So when we were inside the sphere, the charge gets more and more dense as we move uh, further and further out in the sphere. So we would expect that our electric field has a relationship proportional to R or R squared in this case, um, because you expect the electric field to get more and more strong as you move out through your, uh, through your, your sphere. Now, once you're outside the sphere though, you expect it to look like a point charge again, right? Um, if you had like an R squared on the top here, that means that as you move away from your sphere where there's no more charge anymore, your electric field would get stronger. So you would expect it to look like a point charge, right? So notice that we still have here a one over R squared in the, in the bottom. So we still have that um, telltale sign of a point charge, that one over R squared. So that's exactly what you'd expect. When you do this problem, you wanna say, okay, I expect my electric field to be growing with R inside and dropping with one over R squared outside because it should look like a point charge. And then these uh, constants out here, you can rewrite them in terms of one over four pi epsilon naught and the total charge in your sphere. And then you'll still have the one over R squared. So you can rewrite uh, these constants in terms of that. And then this just looks like a, uh, a point charge. Now, the other thing I wanna point out that um, uh, is sort of a stumbling block for a lot of students, is these different R's. So we have kind of like three different R's in this problem. We have R, our variable of integration. We have R, the uh, radius of our Gaussian surface. And then we have capital R. So it's very important when we were inside the sphere that we used small r, because this was the radius of our Gaussian surface. So we used small r on both sides. Now. On this one, when we were outside the sphere, the radius of our Gaussian surface, we were still denoting by small r. So it was little r here. But we integrated all the way to the radius of the uh, sphere, the charge sphere, which was capital R. So if you had put a small r here, you wouldn't have gotten the right answer, right? You would have gotten something that looked like this again. So be really, really careful between your small r's, which refer to your Gaussian, the radius of your Gaussian surface, and then your capital R, which refers to the radius of this charged sphere. And then another thing I also want to um, emphasize 
is that probably when we're doing Gauss's law, the number one thing that students lose points on is like the area of a sphere um, and confusing it with the circumference or the, the volume. So let's just write those down. So actually, let's start with a circle because people make a lot of mistakes with this. So for a circle, the circumference is 2 pi r and the area is pi r squared. I can't tell you how many students make mistakes on this. Um, like I said, it's probably the number one thing that people lose points on when we're doing Gauss's law. So then for a sphere, the surface area is four pi r squared and the volume is four thirds pi r cubed. Now then for a cylinder, the uh, top and bottom area, so like if you orient your cylinder like this, the top and bottom area will just be the area of this circle up top. So it's just the same as the uh, area of a circle. And then the surface area of the outer so the, uh, we'll call it the side area, is the circumference times the length. So then it's two pi r l. And then the volume of a cylinder is the area of the top portion times the length. So then you have pi r squared times l. So, uh, Definitely memorize these because I won't be putting any area or volume um, formulas on your formula sheet. These are things that you absolutely should know. If you're a physics major, engineering major, chemistry major, whatever you are, you should absolutely know the formulas for these surface areas and volumes. And like I said, this is the number one mistake students make with Gauss's law. So definitely make sure you remember where your R squareds are, where your factors of three are, where your R cubed is. Um, so yeah, definitely memorize this. And I will see you guys on next week.